Welcome to All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris, and today I'm joined with Brett Hartle, who is the Government Affairs Director for the Center for Biological Diversity. Hey, Brett, how you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on. No, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for agreeing to uh, do this interview. We were so excited uh, when the center, you know, we've, we've been watching you guys for a long time, agreed to uh, to come on the podcast. And for our listeners, just to set this interview up, this is something different. And today, what we're really going to talk about is coming at the legal angle in conservation and how lawyers like Brett are actually out there fighting for our wild spaces and our wild animals. So today we're going to talk about, you know, lot the Endangered Species Act in the United States. And, you know, for our global listeners, it's, it's still interesting story to listen to the legality of it, because wherever you are in the world, you understand, you know, your own legal systems and government officials and how a lot of these laws affect animals and, and the environment. So thank you so much for coming on, Brett. You know, for our guests, I always like to kind of get some background of you so they kind of understand where you came from. And I, and I guess my first question is, can you just talk about some, you know, where your interest in conservation came from and kind of where you grew up and, and how that led you to where you are today? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I, I grew up back East in New York, but um, I was lucky um, early in life. Um, the first thing that got me interested is I stumbled on something called the student conservation association which is a nonprofit that places high school students and college students in uh, national parks and other public lands to do, to, to basically do volunteer work. And um, in my first year of college, I was lucky enough to be as the, assigned to Olympic national park as a sort of a volunteer backcountry ranger. Um, I also was able then to get a paid job as a summer ranger in Glacier national park and, um, and in, especially in Glacier National Park, one of the big issues is the conservation of grizzly bears, uh, which are, of course, a threatened endangered species or threatened species that's protected by the Endangered Species Act. And it was sort of my first exposure to, to recognizing that there was <laughs> some legal framework larger than I really mm -hmm. understood that governed the management of the wildlife and really set the rules for how people behaved in the parks and uh, started to get me thinking about, uh, you know, conservation. Um, I, after and during college, um, I, I had a couple of different summer jobs. I ended up working in Hawaii, um, and in particular um, on the island of Kauai, uh, uh, on endangered seabirds and endangered songbirds. I was very lucky to get um, to spend four months up in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which is these little dots of land that stretch out from the main Hawaiian islands, about a thousand miles to midway and mm -hmm. uh, these amazing protected seabird colonies with Hawaiian monk seals, which are endangered mm -hmm. uh, Hawaiian sea turtles, but doing all of that work. And, and in particular in Hawaii, um, you know, I started to appreciate that there were lots of impacts to the environment that were sort of, beyond the scope and control of, of, of sort of where I was. So, you know, mm -hmm. the Pacific Northwest Hawaiian islands are dead set in the middle of the garbage patch. So every day, you know, you wake up and there's more garbage on the beach coming from all over the world. And, and you, it's in some ways a fairly helpless feeling because nothing you do there can solve it, even though you, you try to clean it up every day and we would ship it off Island back to the, to the main islands. Um, and I, I started to appreciate that, if you really want to engage in conservation, one of the most important roles is to um, understand that legal framework and to interact in the policy and legal world, because it's those decisions, you know, those laws and rules that are set up that ultimately affect how much we're able to actually, you know, help the environment. Um, so I, I basically switched from uh, being like a biologist and a park ranger and eventually decided to go to law school because I wanted to understand and figure out how I could help uh, really make things bigger in a, in a sort of a bigger picture way. No, I mean, that's amazing. Cause I know you, you know, and you're looking at your bio, you have a, a BS or bachelor's degree in conservation biology. So to turn that around and apply it to law is fascinating. I mean, I was just fascinating looking at, at your bio. So I, I guess my next question would be, you know, 
how did you come to work for the Center for Biological Diversity? Um, yeah, so I was, uh, again, fortunate. Um, right after law school, um, there's a, a fellowship program. It's called the Knaus uh, Sea Grant Fellowship, and it's, an, it's a very old um, program that's run by uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and it places graduate students, law students, um, for one-year fellowships um, in Washington, D.C. Um, some of them are on the Hill. Some of them are in the executive branch. And it's, it's a, a, a really great fellowship. It lets students that have just graduated really dive into the policy world um, at a fairly high level. So I was lucky. I was placed in the House Natural Resources Committee staff um, in the Congress. I was working for the Democrats under then Representative Ed Markey. He's now the Senator from Massachusetts. Um, so I spent a whole year immersed in uh, the politics and policies that impact um, everything having to do with the oceans, but also endangered species, public lands, uh, you know, drilling, uh, the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, and I just learned a great deal about how uh, Congress works and doesn't work. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, and then after that, I, I had a one-year fellowship at the Society for Conservation Biology, which is a, a professional society of scientists that do conservation. Um, uh, again, focusing on sort of national policy issues affecting uh, endangered species and wildlife um, and then uh, joined the center about, uh, back in 2013, and I've been there ever since. So I, I know this was on the list of questions I sent you, but it, it made me think, you know, do we need more lawyers in environmental law? You know, like you're talking about, uh, you know, policy making things like that, because I'm, I'm just thinking of a lot of our listeners that reach out to us and they want to work in conservation, but they're, they're looking at different careers, whether they go out in the field and do research or follow the path that you followed. So could we use some more lawyers in that area? Um, you know, that's a great question. I would say that you don't have to be a lawyer um, to uh, interact with policies, politics, or the law. Um, and in fact, I, I, I teach classes uh, to undergrads and grad students and, and science majors and I, I actually think what's more important of the two is having sort of a, a legal literacy, even if you are not a lawyer. Because um, mm -hmm. what's really important is for scientists, I, I think, is to be engaged in, in the policy arena. I, I always think about folks like, you know, Jane Goodall, um, mm -hmm. you know, great scientists, but also recognized that you have to engage with people. And you have to try to push society to change. And, and the best way to do it is to have a, a good understanding of sort of the legal framework you're living in, because that sort of sets the outer boundaries of what you can and can't accomplish or what you might need to change. So I guess I would say, it, yeah, it never hurts to have more of us, but I think it's equally important for folks to try to appreciate the basics of the law, um, because frankly, some of the most effective advocates that I've seen are folks that are not lawyers, but have learned enough law to be dangerous, I guess, um, and mm -hmm. recognize what you can and can't do and to be become advocates, because that is really what is needed to sort of uh, make conservation happen uh, and to get the changes on the ground that we need to see. No, that's, that's a fascinating, that's a fascinating look from a lawyer's perspective on, I, I agree as a, as a scientist, as somebody who who's worked with endangered species, very ignorant in the law. And then you see, you know, the news or you read the news, you know, the endangered species act, which we're going to get to here in a minute and not understanding. So I think that's why this interview is just, we're, we're so excited to have you to, to help us get a little of that legal literacy that you're talking about. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, your, your role, Government Affairs Director at the Center for Biological Diversity, can you kind of explain what that role is and what you do? Sure. Uh, I, I, I think I'm sort of a jack-of-all-trades type of person. I try to, you know, we, we've lived in a, a political landscape, especially the last few years, that has been very difficult. Um, you know, in 2017 and 2018, 
There was unified Republican control of, of the government, many threats to all of our fundamental environmental laws, unprecedented rollbacks. Um, and my job is to sort of play defense to protect uh, our core environmental laws um, from congressional attacks, as well as to, to help coordinate and uh, respond to the administrative um, actions of the Trump administration, sort of executive branch things. And we'll talk about that when we get to the Endangered Species Act regulations. Um, but I, I, I sort of cover the full portfolio of environmental issues now. Uh, so, you know, obviously endangered species, but public lands, clean air, clean water, toxics, climates, oceans, a little bit of international, um, and just try to make sure that uh, neither Congress or the executive branch uh, is able to sort of uh, undercut uh, the laws that we depend on because much of the work of nonprofits um, in the United States, and it's different in every country, but we depend on having the laws that we have to achieve our missions. You know, if we didn't have an Endangered Species Act, we'd have a very hard time conserving endangered species. You know, if we didn't have a Clean Water Act, you know, rivers would still be catching on fire. So we have to be vigilant to keep um, those laws intact because there are people and interests that would like to see them substantially weakened. Um, so, you know, in any given day, it's a little bit, uh, it's mostly reactive. It depends on what the administration is doing or what's happening. And I, you know, we try our best to respond and put out fires. And when we can make progress, you know, we try to, advance good ideas as well. No, yeah, it's amazing work that you're doing. And, you know, one of the things we always like, you know, we always talk about in our podcast is just the, the, the significant loss of biodiversity that we see around the planet. And just recently, you know, a lot of species we've been covering, like, you know, the wolves, and we just talked right. about woodpeckers and some of these other species native to North America. Or I guess the report that just came out that we've lost nearly 3 billion birds, you know, in population right. in the last 50 years. So we're, we're obviously in this crisis and, you know, our listeners understand that, but can you kind of talk about before we jump into the endangered species act? Cause that's really what, you know, we, we, the meat and potatoes of this interview, but can you just briefly talk about the, the center for biological diversity and what their mission is and, right. you know, their role in trying to protect our native wildlife. Sure. So, you know, I, I'm not going to quote our mission verbatim because I, I don't know off the top of my head, but, you know, our, our, our basic, our, our bread and butter, our, the core of what we do is to be a watchdog and advocacy group that um, first and foremost is focusing on protecting U.S. declining, imperiled, endangered wildlife and plants, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we are focus the most on keeping species in the United States from going extinct. Um, we have a, a, an international program. We do work on a subset of, of international species, including, you know, for example, the critically endangered vaquita porpoise in Mexico, which is close to almost to extinction. Mm -hmm. uh, we work on rhinos and pangolins and elephants, but, but our primary focus has been to protect endangered species in the United States using the law, using legal tools and advocacy to really achieve conservation um, in the real world. Um, so getting species protected, getting them on a road to recovery, making sure the, the federal government and state government and private actors don't harm them. Um, and obviously beyond that, you know, we also care about the many of the indirect threats. So we, you know, we, we work on protections of public lands, but there's always some tie back to, a biodiversity component because that's what we're most focused on. So we, we work on many, many environmental issues, but in some ways it always does come back to wildlife and plants and keeping them from going extinct and then the logical outgrowths. So, you know, we have a large pesticide effort as well because pollution pesticides are a massive threat to biodiversity, you know? Um, so it, it's a, it's a growing, we're a growing organization. We, we try to take on as more than we can chew um, and we use the law uh, you know, we file many lawsuits. We, we, we go to, we lobby in Congress, we advocate in the media 
and, and on the ground and grassroots, all with the goal of trying to conserve species. And, and you know, and yeah, obviously we have this huge, huge biodiversity crisis right now. Um, I mean, it, I hate you know using the 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 sort of phrase, but it's like, yeah, this is a mass extinction. It's an extinction crisis. Um, it's, it's very scary and dangerous for, you know, not only the planet, but obviously our own civilization to be wiping out biodiversity. Um, and we, you know, try to do our part in stopping that. Right. Right. And I, yeah, I mean, we've near, covered nearly almost a hundred species now endangered, you know, most of them are endangered and, each species we cover and we look at the pressures they're facing and it, it, it's really horrifying. You know, it's absolutely yeah. horrifying when you look and it's on every continent. It's not just, you know, yep. you always look at Asia or Africa or something, but it's here in North America, you yep. know? So yeah, it's critical. The, the, the center for biological diversity, what they're doing. So to set kind of set up before we, we jump into the endangered species act, I, I would kind of ask, ask it like this, because obviously the Trump administration's goal and they're, they're clear about it. They've come out in the media and said it is to really kind of gut the Endangered Species Act and some of these other acts that are used to protect our clean water, things like that. Yeah. Prior to the Trump administration, how well was our legal system working in protecting wildlife or our ecosystems? Um, well, uh, the Endangered Species Act is a very successful law. Um, and we'll we'll talk about why in a bit, but you know, when it is you know working and in place, the Endangered Species Act has prevented the extinction of about ninety nine percent of the species in its care. So, if you get listed as a plant or animal, you have a pretty good chance of surviving. Um, you know, occasionally they you know species are lost to extinction. It does happen. But that is actually, you know, the, the, the current rates that we're protecting them is sort of better than, better than average. Um, about 50 species in the last 50 years have gone extinct while waiting to be protected under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and that illustrates sort of one, one reality, which is even before the Trump administration, there, there were still attacks on the Endangered Species Act. And it is unfortunately a, a fairly political partisan issue now. Um, there are people, there are special interests that oppose protecting endangered species. They see it as a threat to economic activity. Um, but if wildlife is listed or a plant is listed under the act, it has a much, much greater chance of getting on a road to recovery uh, than if it doesn't. Um, so it is a very effective law. Uh, the good news is, is that it's, it's still here. Uh, the Trump administration has done some damage um, as at a regulatory level, which is very serious, but luckily we still have the law and it, it has not been, you know, gutted yet. And we will, you know, we, that's one of our top objectives is to never allow that to happen. Um, so it is quite effective and successful. Um, and it is, you know, still the gold standard around the world that many nations copy uh, many states have copied it inside the United States. It still is the best example of a law that is designed to preserve biological diversity anywhere in the world. Right. And before, I guess, you know, I kind of want to ask you, you know, what do you think Trump's motives are? I mean, I think I know profit, but before we get there, can you kind of just explain to our listeners, I guess, how the Endangered Species Act works? Sure. Yeah, so in a nutshell, um, the Endangered Species Act works, and it works really well for a couple of key reasons. First, when it comes to decisions about listing and, and a few other provisions, there's a very, very clear mandate that says follow the best available science. So don't look at economic considerations of the day. You know, if a species is on a path to extinction, it's on a path to extinction. That's what the science says. The second thing that the ESA does, Endangered Species Act does, is there's a prohibition on take. And that means, take means to kill, harm, injure um, a species that is listed. And this is an absolute clear command that no one, private party, federal government, state government, can kill endangered species as a basic rule. Um, 
unless they follow certain processes. And the next key process is if for some reason you have to harm endangered species, you must consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service to make sure that your harm is properly mitigated, minimized, and does not put a species on a path to extinction. That's called the Section 7 consultation process. But what's really important is to just recognize that the, the reason this law is so successful is that philosophically, and the Supreme Court has said this way back in the day, the Endangered Species Act's premise is that we should, as a society um, across all of the federal government, prioritize the conservation of endangered species and to recover them, whatever the cost. And that's a, whatever the cost is, is a direct quote from a Supreme Court case in 1978 called Tennessee Valley Authority v. Hill, which basically affirmed that the Endangered Species Act was sort of absolutist um, when it comes to avoiding extinction. That is the most important mandate that we have um, basically as a society. Uh, so it works well because it doesn't compromise at the outset. And, but obviously if, if you have a law that, you know, is, is as strong, that's what engenders the, the blowback. Um, and what we, you know, what the Trump administration's motive is, is to try to, you know, appease in industry and special polluters and other, other forces that don't like the fact that we are willing to spend the money. We are willing to prioritize species over um, other economic interests. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, listening to you talk. So it, it's from our standpoint, people that live and breathe conservation, you know, in, in your standpoint in the center for biological diversity, you know, like you said, we are in this mass extinction event. I mean, all evidence, all scientific evidence, proof of, species loss, like you said, Vaquita porpoise is pretty much extinct or will be extinct very soon. It, you know, I know there's people fighting to try to save them, but, you know, it's frustrating for us and, a, you know, the average American or say the average citizen in another country that their government, like say Brazil, you know, right now the Amazon's on fire, or it was on fire and it still is. It, it, you know, these, these laws are just so critical. So when you talk about profit and and motivation. I mean, is that really what drives them is, you know, we don't care or we, you know, put our fingers in the ears, blah, blah, blah. We're not listening to you or the, the experts. We just want to make money. I mean, is that kind of the bottom line? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I, I mean, it, it's always tough to sort of, I don't know, attempt to rationalize or, you know, speak for what, what their intentions are. But it's hard to think of another justification other than the, you know, a, a short term interest to increase, you know, profit margins. Um, you know, the Endangered Species Act, you know, does have flexibilities. It does allow uh, for compromise. There are many ways that, you know, there are 1,700 endangered species in the United States now. And over the last 40 something years, our economy has grown massively as has our population, yet we can still recover species. Uh, just today, they announced the delisting of the Kirtland's warbler in Michigan as another recovered species. Um, you know, it took a lot of money. It took a lot of effort to make it happen. Um, and it, at, at its core, you know, the issue is a moral question, right? Is it worth it to save endangered species? And it's hard to understand what, you know, how you would come to the answer of no, other than you simply are focused on economics. Now, I will acknowledge that obviously we live in a different society. And I, I always try to, you know, remember that, you know, this is, this is our rules. This is our framework. We have, we are fortunate in having the resources to being able to uh, address um, our conservation challenges. When you think about a place like Brazil, I mean, obviously, it's somewhat more complicated. I mean, you've got big agribusiness just trying to clear cut the, the rainforest for, for ranching and soy, and they exploit the needs of, you know, people who are quite poor, who just need to make a living. Um, but, you know, in the United States, it's, it's hard to imagine why we wouldn't save endangered species since we can, we have the technical know-how, the scientific know-how and the resources to do it other than, 
some business interests think it's just too expensive. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, listening to you and it, it, that's, I mean, I know that's a challenge of conservation in certain parts of the world, as far as, you know, when you have people barely surviving and how do you tell them not to like the bushmeat trade in Africa, it's like, how do you tell them not to hunt to eat? But you know, here in the United States, we're such a wealthy nation and you know, we just covered wolves a few weeks ago and talking about a ra- one rancher in, in Washington state, I think over yeah. t- close to 20 wolves have been killed because they, yeah. they go after his cows and it's different packs coming in. It's not the same pack. And yeah. it's, and he, and that, and that particular rancher is philosophically opposed to not the endangered species act, but he sees wolves as a surrogate of federal power. And it's this sort of kind of fringe right wing libertarian viewpoint that manifests because he could do things that would easily address wolf conflict, but he refuses Mm -hmm. because he doesn't like the federal government. And, you know, again, it comes down to like, we can find solutions. It's not that expensive. You know, there are, yeah, there are costs, but they are worth paying because we as a society have already agreed. And, you know, endangered species act is overwhelmingly popular across the political spectrum, Republican, Democrat, Independent. It's only a loud, loud uh, fringe at you know, sort of the, the right wing that is as hostile as it is. And, and unfortunately, they've captured the, that political space. But yeah, it's, it's in this country, we, we have the ability to do it if we were to put our mind to it. And it's just a question of political will. Uh, no, absolutely. It absolutely is. And, you know, I think empowering, you know, the populace to, to make their opinions known that this is not okay. And we're not okay with gutting this because it, it, it's kind of truly horrific. Now, just to kind of add this in, I think here is, you know, Trump is also trying or his Trump's administration, I should say, is trying to gut the what the Clean Water Act and a few others, correct? Yeah. And so, you know, good news, bad news, you know, since we're talking about the law, um, you know, all federal, federal agencies have regulations that implement environmental laws, just like any other law. They're sort of the guideposts, the rules of the road, the, 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 the fine details of how to make real the mandates of the Clean Water Act, right? Or the Endangered Species Act. Um, so it's important when we talk about, you know, attacks of the Trump administration to recognize that what they are trying to do is to change the regulations, the, the fine details, um, generally to weaken the requirements, uh, to make it easier for industry special interests to pollute or harm the environment, um, through a regulatory process. Um, and you know, what they're doing with clean water, for example, is to, drastically narrow the definition of what a wetland is so that most, unfortunately, most wetlands will not qualify anymore for protection under the Clean Water Act uh, if this proposal by the Trump administration happens, Um, which would be terrible. It'd be terrible for wildlife. It'd be terrible for water quality, for drinking water um, and all that. The, The good news piece, and again, this comes back to the law, is that Congress you know, don't, don't always knock them. Sometimes they get things right. Recognized a long time ago that when it comes to regulations, um, executive branch actions, that it was absolutely critical for the public, not only to have a right to comment and to provide input, but also to sue. Um, So we have a right under what's called the administrative procedure act, as well as what they call citizen suit provisions under the Clean Water Act and Endangered Species Act and and other laws, that we have the right to go to court to challenge what the what the executive branch does so that it to make sure it actually follows the law. And it's one of the most important checks on, frankly, executive power that are out there. I mean, honestly, if you look at anything Trump does, everyone runs to court the next day. Um, Having that ability is critical because it holds the government accountable to make sure that it follows the, the commands of Congress when it writes the laws. So yeah, with the clean water act, what we're seeing is, you know, it's still an ongoing process, but I pretty much can guarantee you as soon as 
they finalize it will be in court. And, you know, we will, I think probably prevail because what they're proposing is so draconian and so myopic that there's no way that just because a wetland is connected to a stream underground instead of on the surface, that therefore it doesn't deserve protections because that's basically in a nutshell, what the Trump administration is trying to argue. Right. And, you know, for the average, I guess, American, should we be concerned about, you know, the actions they're taking? I mean, this is, you know, clean water. Like who doesn't want to drink clean water? <laughs> I yeah. just don't get how, you know, they're, they're kowtowing or, or, you know, allowing polluters to, to do what they used to do before all these acts were passed. So, you know, yeah. the average American, I mean, should they be alarmed, awakened, get active? Yeah. I mean, and I think many are and have been, um, I mean, you know, every administration, Republican or Democrat obviously has a slightly different take on things, but it is truly remarkable sort of the scale and sort of ferocity of what the Trump administration keeps doing. Like they just, they just don't seem to care what, what even reasonable people think. I mean, it's like, it's punitive. It's, it's like, it's petty. I mean, the, the, the things that they're proposing gutting, you know, are, have had longstanding bipartisan support. Um, so, you know, yeah, if you, if 50% or more of all wetlands in the United States lost protection under the clean water act, you would think that that would, most people would be like, wow, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of insane. Right. Or like, you know, the clean cars rollback where, you know, even the car companies don't really want to see the fuel economy standards, drastically cut and you no, know, it's basically just like the only people that benefit is the oil and gas industry because if your car isn't as efficient then you need to spend more money on fuel um yeah i mean the the scope of the attacks i think has galvanized the public in a way that we haven't seen before so that you know people are speaking out in huge numbers and protesting and, and trying to shame this administration considering what they've done Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so getting back to the Endangered Species Act, it's, you know, I, I guess if you could kind of maybe bust some myths or what people think about it, like, how is that usually enforced? You know, when, um, like you said, species get listed or delisted. So when a species listed, what does that mean? And I guess when you just said this war warbler out of Michigan just got delisted, what does that mean? Right. So, um, when I think of myths um, and, and, and what it all means, actually, you know, this is a good opportunity again to talk about Tennessee, Tennessee Valley Authority versus Hill, which was a Supreme Court case from 1978. And in that case, what's interesting about it is um, it was a fight over the future of this tiny fish called the snail darter, uh, which was threatened by the, the, proposed construction of a dam by the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a federal agency in the Southeast that uh, provides hydropower to large, large numbers of people. And this lawsuit started in like 1974, 75-ish, like the Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973. Um, and the history of this case is really interesting because it illustrates something that I think is a myth that, that people don't realize that since the beginning of the Endangered Species Act, citizens, environmental organizations, scientists outside of the government had a huge role in making the law real and also making sure conservation happened. Uh, so, you know, the Endangered Species Act is passed in 1973. There's this tiny little fish it's citizens and scientists that immediately petitioned to list the fish under the Endangered Species Act. It wasn't the federal government doing on its own. It was only because um, a group of citizens and scientists petitioned for it. Um, and then when it was listed, um, after that citizen involvement, again, it was ordinary people, scientists, environmental groups that then said, but if you build this giant dam, um, the fish will go extinct. Uh, and it was, again, citizens going to court saying, this is going to cause the extinction of this fish. You can't allow this. 
And that's when the Supreme Court said, you know, basically, look, yeah, this dam is almost built, but Congress was absolutely clear that we are supposed to recover and save endangered species, whatever the cost. So they stopped the dam, right? Um, and in a, you know, sort of, it's like a, it's a good story, partly because just, you know, the species is now almost at recovery levels. It's all the conservation that has gone into the snail darter in the decades since, um, it, it's probably ready to be delisted at this point because it's now thriving again. Um, but throughout the history of the act from the beginning up till the modern day, it really has been scientists and ordinary people um, and, and environmental organizations that have held the government accountable to make sure that the law works well. And so like one of the big myths you hear from the other side is, you know, all of these pesky environmental groups are abusing the legal system and it's just a scam, you know, designed to enrich the groups themselves. But, but, but no, really since the beginning, it's been, it's been the role of these outside parties, including, you know, the center for biological diversity and many others that have gotten most species listed. <laughs> uh, you know, we own our organization has gotten, depending on how you count, 600 ish, 700 ish species on the list. Um, you know, that's about a third of them. Um, so many have, have, have helped with that effort because frankly, agencies, they feel political pressure to not do anything and it re they require constant prodding um, and constant oversight to follow the law. And that's, and that's not even unique to the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the Clean Water Act has a citizen suit provision. The Clean Air Act has a citizen suit provision. And it has always been watchdogs going out after people that are breaking the law, including the government itself, that have made these laws work so well. Um, it's integral to the process. Like people don't recognize it necessarily, but you know, the reason that the air and water has gotten cleaner over these decades is in, is in large part because of the people out there in the real world bringing lawsuits. No, it's so true. I live, I grew up in Southern California and I, I remember the days of smog and the brown haze, not being able to walk outside and breathe or run, uh, you know, going up into the mountains and looking and it looks like just a brown cloud over the LA basin. I mean, it was horrific and that's, eliminated now or almost uh, eliminated. You don't have any uh, smog days. So yeah, that's all important. It's all important. So you talked about the, the Center for Biological Diversity listing species, but can you kind of talk about, uh, you know, are you involved in any lawsuits right now uh, with the Endangered Species Act? Oh yeah, many. I mean, <laughs> they, they take various forms and, and, you know, maybe this is a good a time to talk about something like, you know, the Rosemont Mine. It's a good example of, you know, once a species is listed, then that triggers all sorts of obligations for, you know, the federal government, for private parties in terms of, again, harming species that are on the list. Um, so a good example of a, of a legal fight that we've been having is there's this large proposed mine in Southeast Arizona in the Santa Rita mountains, a um, uh, copper mine that would be this giant hole in the ground. Um, and that would cause all sorts of terrible things such as water pollution downstream, harming the aquifer. It's upstream of the city of Tucson, but also this giant hole in the ground would have been squarely in the critical habitat of Jaguar. Um, we have a couple Jaguar and one of the places where camera traps picked up Jaguars in you know, recent years was basically right where the mine was. Uh, there are a couple other endangered species, um, you know, either a couple plants at the mine, a couple other species downstream. Um, and using the law uh, to challenge whether or not this mine, you know, violated the Endangered Species Act, violated the Clean Water Act and other laws, um, you know, we, we recently had a court victory where the judge agreed um, not on, we haven't finished the case, but, but basically you know, we, we've won a really important round of the case and stopped the mine from happening. They were, they were days from starting groundbreaking operations and now that's all on hold again. 
Um, so, you know, there are many lawsuits that we are challenging either really badly proposed projects or other types of harm that are currently happening or are threatening in the future. Um, because obviously if you want to get an endangered species on the road to recovery, one of the first things you need to stop to stop is like the really bad things that are hurting it. Um, so we, 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 we try to focus not only on getting them listed, but then we think about what can we do to accelerate their conservation um, and to get them on the road to recovery. Um, another example of a lawsuit that's ongoing um, in Oregon, we've got a case against uh, the state and basically in private timber interests because the logging practices in Oregon um, are leading to all sorts of um, excessive sedimentation. So they log the slopes, they don't do anything to control the runoff, the, the hillside slides into the creek and that suffocates the salmon. Um, there are there are many. We we file many lawsuits. We're not ashamed of that. Um, we have a lot going at any one time. But but the basic idea is you know yes we need to get them listed. That takes lawsuits. But then you know then we want to see conservation happen because frankly until a species gets listed often it's just neglected. And as much as we'd like to hope and assume that um, you know state fish and game agencies or other parties are doing a good job with stewardship. The reality is, is that until things get kind of bleak and, and or species needs to be listed it off, they are often neglected. So they've been going through just this long steady decline with like no, no attention. And, and that's really the thing that galvanizes conservation to get things going in the right direction again. No, yeah, it's it's fascinating listening to you talk about that. And I do want to talk about this this court decision in a second because it, it was the Animal Law podcast where, you know, I, I heard that story and I'll put the link in our show notes as well as the uh the media coverage of the decision because it, by the time it was Mark and he was talking about another one of your lawyers and that you hadn't got the decision yet. And then the decision came down after the podcast aired and so I, I was excited to read that one. Uh, just for our listeners real quick, I mean, how do you go about filing a lawsuit and, and kind of the legal process of that? What's just kind of the, the basics of how that goes? I know, you know, there's a decision, then there'll be appeals all the way up, maybe to the Supreme Court, you know, but I don't think our listeners understand the, the, the complete legal process of, of how this works. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so... Lawsuits can take many forms, but perhaps the most relevant and interesting piece of it from the perspective of a non-lawyer, which I think most folks don't know, is that when you go to federal court to challenge, let's say, a federal agency that's violating the Endangered Species Act or the Clean Water Act or, or a private party, for that matter, the, the federal courts have said, and the Supreme Court has said, that in order to go to court, you have to have what's called legal standing. Um, and the, the basic idea of legal standing is that only people who have a legitimate interest in an issue are actually allowed to file a lawsuit. And what that means is just because you are a concerned citizen doesn't mean you're allowed to go to court and say, challenge the Trump administration's latest terrible thing when it comes to endangered species. But if you have a personal concrete injury from that, um, you know, thing you're wanting to challenge in court, then you can go to court. Um, so for example, um, I, in my own personal spare time, um, I'm a wildlife photographer. I love travel. Um, I've gone to Africa many times. I have a personal injury when the Trump administration, let's say, does something really terrible when it comes to trophy hunting. Because I have seen lions and elephants and rhinos. I've seen forest elephants. I've seen leopards and, and, what, and, and many, many species. I am personally harmed when the Trump administration decides to green light trophy hunting again, 
because it means there will be fewer elephants and lions and leopards in the wild. And it diminishes my ability, the likelihood that I'm going to see wildlife and I may be seeing, you know, depleted wildlife because of bad conservation practices overseas. Um, another example closer to home, um, I, uh, I'm a big bird watcher. Um, I have seen whooping cranes many, many times. I've gone to Texas many times to see them on their wintering grounds, as well as along their migration corridor um, in the Midwest. So something like the Keystone Pipeline, if it were to be built, harms me because it threatens the whooping crane. And if there are no whooping cranes or fewer whooping cranes, then that means that my personal interest um, in actually observing wildlife that I take personal satisfaction from um, is diminished. So in order to go to court, the, the biggest threshold thing in order to do it is to actually have legal standing. And that means that that's why organizations need members. Um, that's why we depend on you know, working with scientists and wildlife enthusiasts and ordinary people all around the country and the world is because you can't just go to court and challenge something you don't agree with unless it actually harms you. So, you know, we are a national organization that focuses on wildlife nationwide. We have to spend a lot of time when we think about going to court to make sure that we actually will be harmed by that decision. Um, so, um, when it comes to actually filing a lawsuit, that threshold thing, which is why actually it's super important for ordinary people to A, go outside and recreate and appreciate endangered species and then become members of organizations like mine, is because we actually legitimately have to show that, that this is harming our members and our interests. Once, once that's done, then it's just a matter of filling out some paperwork um, and hopefully having smarter and better attorneys than the government. Um, and fighting it out to the end, however long that may take. Um, you know, we have a good success rate. It's still in the 90% range. But, um, you know, that's, you know, once you get to the mechanics of the lawsuit, it's it's um, fairly dry and, un, and uninteresting until you get to either a victory or a defeat. Um, but that, that most important point is that, and, and it comes back to like your first question about, you know, what's what do you need as more lawyers? I, I it comes back to it's like we need people that actually love wildlife um, to be part of sort of the advocacy process because we need people like that in order to actually bring lawsuits. Because if there isn't someone who loves, you know, a, a little snail or a frog or a fish or a reptile or whatever it is, then we're we can't even get into the courthouse. Right, right. No, it's uh, it's still fascinating how it all works. The, just quickly, you know, we're closing in on an hour, and I uh, wanted to kind of touch upon that the copper mine, the Rosemont copper mine, and just quickly, you know, talking about the decision. It was the Santa Rita's versus U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The, the articles I read, they said this was a monumental decision for for the wildlife in that area. Is that your read on it? Like, was was it a really good decision? Uh, that came out of that court? It was. And, and what's interesting about that decision, um, you know, when you do go to court, um, you know, you don't, you never want to put all your eggs in one basket. Um, you want to have as many solid, credible legal arguments that you can muster uh, because you never know. I mean, judges are people and they may not agree with one of your arguments. Um, so we, we basically were challenging this giant copper mine that's on public lands um, we had three basic arguments. One, the mine approval did not comply with the Endangered Species Act. Two, the mine did not comply with the Clean Water Act. And three, the mine did not comply with the Mining Act, which is this old antiquated law from 1872 that is just so pro-mining. It's very, very, it's very bad law. Very hard to fix because the mining interest is powerful and entrenched. But the judge said, um, basically, under the mining law, if you have a what's called a legitimate claim or patent, sorry, there's a bird calling in the background. Um, oh, that's okay. That's okay. If, if you have a legitimate mining patent, which means a claim to a valuable mineral, you are entitled this is strange, basically to have that public land, this national forest land, 
it's almost de facto your land and we can't stop the mine. Um, it's a very pro mining law. So <laughs> Rosemont found, you know, a very, very uh, valuable deposit of copper. Um, there's no doubt about that. But in their mining claim and their application, they proposed that they would take the tailings, so the mine waste, the rubble, and dump that waste on sort of a nearby area of land. I think somewhere in the order of like 3,000 acres or so. So not a mm -hmm. Small mm -hmm. pile of rocks, which would, I think, effectively bury this creek, um, destroy a watershed. And the judge ruled that under the mining law, that mining company also had an obligation to show that the disposal lands that they wanted to just throw their waste on were also valuable mining claims. Because yes, Rosemont, you may have a right to mine, but you don't have a right to pollute other land around the mine, um, which no judge had ever ruled on um, in that way. So basically saying, yes, that's true. You get 20 acres to dig your hole in the ground and maybe expand it. But that doesn't mean that you're entitled to then to despoil the rest of the national forest just because you have a valuable mining claim somewhere else. And, and effectively, you know, if you, if they can't put the mine waste on public lands, they're, they're pretty much, they're pretty much done because a massive amount of material, like they, they'd have to transport it, you know, a long way away at a, at a very high cost, it may not make the mine viable. So this ruling was in some ways very unprecedented because it finally put a limit on the mining law, which in general is a good thing. Like it's a very, very bad law. Um, and, you know, it will help us fight other terrible mines elsewhere. Um, now we are still waiting and we expect uh, also a decision on the Endangered Species Act issues, which we hope we will win um, in the meantime. But for the time being, basically this mine is dead in the water. Um, if we went on the Endangered Species Act issues, all the better because then it's dead twice. Um, mm. And you know, you want to, you want to win as much as you can to make it as difficult for the other side to, to, you know, overturn you on appeal because, you know, court cases are never certain. You never know until the judges rule how it's going to go, but the more things you win on, the better. Um, so this was a, you know, a huge victory uh, to stop this really terrible mine that, you know, they've been trying to build this thing for 20 years um, and we've beat them at every, every junction, um, every attempt, but, you know, they never stop, uh, which is, you know, not the reality of doing this type of work. It's like you win that's great. One on the Keystone pipeline three or four times, but it never ends. Like we, we just have to keep being vigilant and keep fighting because the other side still sees, you know, billions of dollars in future profit. Dollar signs. Yeah. Yeah. That's what so, I was say, dollar signs. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. That's great work you, you guys are doing. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's stories that need to be told and, and, and really promoted out there that people understand what's going on, you know, especially in the court system, how you're fighting for our, our like I said, wild spaces and wildlife. Uh, just, a, just a couple of final questions. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you kind of talked about needing advocates. So, you know, kind of seeing how does the Center for Biological Diversity, I know that it's a nonprofit, but how do you afford all these lawsuits? So how do, I guess, how do they support you in your activities? And yeah. then how can our listeners help you in your activities? Sure. I mean, you know, we are like many nonprofits, um, pretty much a member uh, supported organization. Um, people give us money. Uh, we are a, uh, well, I would say no frills, but you know, you don't get a tote bag when you join the center for biological diversity, you get, you, get, you know, a thank you and you get, um, you know, you get, to know what we're doing and, and to know that you're helping with the cause. We try to, to, you know, focus as much of our resources on doing good conservation work as we can. Um, and we've got, you know, many members and folks can, can join. You just go to biologicaldiversity.org. Um, and that's how you, that's how we basically uh, stay afloat. Um, we, you know, again, like I said, I, and this is, you know, 
sincere. We, we also depend on our members um, having a passion for nature and for wildlife and wild places, because again, when we do go to court, we have to turn to our members and say, oh, I hope somebody loves jaguars out there and has tried to go see them and visited the Santa Rita's in Arizona or whatever the species might be, because we need, we are basically, um, you know, we are supporting our members' interests as well in protecting wildlife and, 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 and wild places. So, you know, without members, we, we, we can't do the work that we're doing um, in many ways. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's quite easy to join and it's all self-explanatory on the website. So that's, you know, that's the main, that is, you know, pretty much how we are, are, are funded. Awesome. And I definitely will provide the links in the show notes so our listeners can go and, and sign up and support what you're doing. It, it, it's a wonderful organization. And I know we're going to try to get more interviews out of you guys. It's You have tons of uh, scientists and experts that we just would love to talk to and, and yeah. kind of promote more of what you're doing. It, Brett, it's it, amazing stuff. I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, Brett Hartle, the Government Affairs Director at the Center for Biological Diversity, you know, talking about the Endangered Species Act, kind of what's going on out there. And, and I would love to have you on again, you know, in say a year or so and see where we're at because it, it, it's still a long fight. You know, we've got a lot, like you said, you've got to stay vigilant and, um, you know, but I'd love to get an update, you know, in a few months time to see where we're at. Sure. Yeah, no worries. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much and uh, take care. Yeah. And just, just so, and just a, a quick note too, if, if you have, I know you've talked to a couple of folks on staff, but um, I'm mm-hmm. going to put in a plug um, for one of our staffers in particular. Um, you can look, see her on our website, Tiara Curry. Mm-hmm. She's our senior scientist in our endangered species program. And uh, she is a outstanding not only scientists, but advocate and storyteller when it comes to protecting species that most people haven't heard of and don't understand why they're important. Um, you know, if, if the, the most endangered group of, of, of species in the United States are freshwater mussels and mm-hmm. may not seem like they're very charismatic, but, uh, she can, uh, she can explain to you <laughs> far, far, far. Right. Than I could, um, she's really, she's really excellent. So I would say if you, if you were to do a follow up, I mean, obviously feel free to follow with me whenever you want, but, um, yeah, yeah. It would, she's an excellent person to talk to, to really dive in on, you know, like the full web of life, um, from the perspective of like, it's not, you know, obviously we all love wolves, but it's it's also about crayfish and mussels and bugs and plants and things you've never heard of. And she does it better than anyone pretty much in the country. No, that's it's so true. It's so true. We try to, you know, because, you know, Angie and I, my, my partner, we're, we're both, you know, animal enthusiasts and did research in, in large mammals. But we always talk about, you know, we try to talk about plants and these other things that, that are just as critical to the ecosystem. And so I, I, I will tell our listeners, I'm going to chase that one down. I will chase that one down and we will try to get her on as soon as we can because uh, yeah, just amazing she's... stuff that you're doing. Yeah, she's fantastic. Well, Brett, thank you so much for taking taking the time to speak to us and uh, keep keep the fight going. You know, please keep it keep it going. We do appreciate it. Okay. Yep. No worries. Like I said, feel free to come and reach out again. 